Good evening and welcome to our um, rectory study group. Uh, this evening we're going to be looking at the topic of genre and the Gospels. And um, I meant to pull my notes up here, so I'm just going to do that quickly. Uh, the notes should have been posted on Facebook just, uh, you know, down there somewhere. And of course, as always, they're on the parish website um, under sermons and series, bottom of the page. Yeah. If you, this is probably not your first rodeo. So give me a few more seconds while I grab my notes. And um, I'll give you a chance to grab yours. And uh, yeah, so we. Where's. Um, uh, okay, there we go. I can work with technology. Don't panic about me. Was it last? It was, it was just about a week ago, Friday, I think, um, in one of the other study groups we do, we were discussing genre. And the question was raised, how do you know the genre of the text that you're dealing with? And um, the short answer is it's actually not easy. You see, uh, where is I? Okay, so uh, give me my... Um, when we pick up a book, and um, I put an example there on the notes, if you've got them, of a cover of a book that I've got on my bookshelf, The Crippled Land by Max Licardo. Even without opening it, without reading it, without a thing except what's in front of you, you can start to tease out some ideas. So the first thing you'd see is you'd probably go, that's a kid's book, right? And looking at the artwork, it's, it's like it's a sentimental kid's book. Um, and it's called The Crippled Lamb, and it's Max Licardo. So if you know anything about Max Licardo, it's a Christian book for kids. It's a bit sentimental. It's a bit sort of, you know. Um, and you've managed to narrow down the genre without even looking inside the text. On the other hand, when you pick up a Bible, it doesn't actually give you that many clues. Uh, it's It's one... It looks like one text. The paper is all one sort of paper. Often the print is pretty consistent. Um, you know, it might occasionally be set slightly differently, but there's, it, it's not immediately obvious what the genre is. So in terms of genre, what I'm talking about is I'm not talking about sort of, you know, sci-fi or fantasy necessarily, but the genre is the agreement that we kind of have when we start to read. So if I pick up a book that says Once Upon a Time, I immediately know the agreement that the author and I have is that this is basically a fairy tale, right? Um, if I pick up The Crippled Lamb with that cover on the front, the agreement that I've entered into with Max Licardo is that this is primarily about... Uh, you know, it's like a kid's book. And if it turns out to be deeply disturbing and gory, he, he's messed with the genre. Max Licardo's not going to do that. Um, but you get the idea. You get the idea. So for a genre to exist, it has to essentially, it relies on there being a pre-existing agreement between the creator of the text, whatever it is, and the audience. So you can't get uh, a unique genre because you, you don't have a pre-existing agreement. But genres shift. You know, I, my favorite example of that is I was looking for uh, a book, just, you know, something to read. And I went into a secondhand bookstore and the guy there said, asked what I was into. I said science fiction and fantasy. And I was looking through some stuff and he found me some stuff. And he said, this is set in a fantasy world but it's actually a political novel and so the the way the tension ratchets is in, is in a kind of a political structuring and that was the first time i was clued to the way genres shift um 
I mean, I probably should have been clued into it by reading things like Oliver Twist and novels back then, different to novels now, sentence structures, pacing, all those sorts of things. So when we look at the genre of the Gospels, and I want to look at the genre of the, of the Gospels and the genres in the Gospels this evening. When we look at the genre of the Gospels, I'm going to start by focusing on Mark, because in a sense, Mark's the inventor of the gospel genre um, and I know we've spoken previously about source theory for the gospels um, and I just got another graphic uh, there on the notes if you want to have a look that gives you an idea of how much from from uh, Luke and Matthew is from Mark's gospel. So Mark's gospel between 66 and 70 it was written prior to the destruction of the temple. Um, and it's the prototype gospel. And if we look at its genre, it should give us clues as to the other, the, the genre of the other gospels. And structurally, Mark seems to draw from three dominant genres uh, from his time. And the reason I say from his time is even if we were to try and... Um, Look, well, the first one's a good example. So the first is what's called a bios or a life. Um, and the closest we'd have these days is like is something like a biography. Um, but it's still not exactly the same because a bios was essentially the hero story. So perhaps a closer example would be, um, you know, a movie based on someone's life. And you kind of, you smooth out the rough edges you give them a, a heroic chiseled jaw, um, I don't know, uh, you, you kind of leave out some of the complexities. It's not such an issue if, you, you don't, if you're not 100% historical accurate. But if you were to do a, a, an autobiography or if you were to do a biography for, for someone um, like, say, Winston Churchill, and you left out his date of birth or, or something like that, that's a pretty significant thing. Not so much for an ancient bios. And bios, by the way, were, were essentially Greek hero stories. But hero stories primarily were people who were kind of, you know, the general of the army might get a bios written about him or, or something like that. So they weren't, uh, they weren't like the epics uh, with the Greek, and Greek gods and things like that. Uh, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead. When you come to Luke Acts, uh, you almost get something that mimics some of the epics because it's got this theme that runs across multiple characters. So when you're dealing with Luke Acts, it's got a sprinkling of, uh, of the big epic. One of the things that is very significant in terms of reading the Gospels as bios is remember how I said it's the it's a hero story. Jesus is crucified, and so a bias might be tempted to kind of edit that out or downplay it, but it's clearly not edited out in any way, shape, or form. It's there. It's a strong component of the Gospels, all four of the Gospels. In fact, you might argue that the Gospels are essentially. One of the questions they're dealing with is, how do you think about or understand the death of Jesus? You certainly don't think of that as a hero's death. Okay, so bios. Um, there's also an element of uh, what's called apocalypsis. So apocalyptic literature tends to be have a, sort of an element of the fantastical about it, but it is, in a sense, primarily about a particular group. So in Daniel or Revelation, you get this group that are suppressed, oppressed, and it's their writing that's talking about, in the end, we will be free, or good will triumph over evil, and evil is those who are oppressing us. So Daniel and Revelation are in the genre of apocalypsis. Mark has a lot of that, and then out of that, so do Matthew, Luke, and to a certain extent, John. 
But if you look at some of those others, like, you know, if you look at Revelations, there's angels and trumpets and, and symbolic language around beasts. Mark has removed a lot of the, the symbolic stuff from Apocalypsis as a genre. So he still kept that ideological thing. Um, and a really kind of good example of that is if you look at the beginning, you know, the description of a gospel. Uh, we often translate it as good news, but it was a political statement. So uh, it was about saying, hey, this document actually subverts or undermines the political uh, structure that we live in. So, so there's that. The other theme that seems to be, well, genre in a sense, that seems to have fed itself into the genre of the Gospels, is Midrash. Now, Midrash is a tricky word because it's a word that we use now, kind of uh, Jewish people will use it quite a bit. Um, and so when I'm talking about Midrash, I'm talking about Midrash that's 2,000 years ago. Ima imagine I spoke about literature and I wasn't talking about anything that was written in the last 1,700 years. Midrash. If it's been written in the last 17, 18, 1900 years, it doesn't count as an influence here. Um, so Midrash is commentary on scripture. Uh, and we, so we see in the Gospels a, a number of places where we see commentary on scripture. But in a way, it's also possible to read the Gospels as commentary on the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. And so in that understanding, and John is probably this, by my reading, John would be the closest to Midrash. It's theological commentary on the, the Torah of Jesus Christ. A Torah, obviously Jewish, refers primarily to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But Midrash is commentary on the revelation of God in Scripture. And John, as Midrash, is theological commentary of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. So we've got these three genres of text that kind of get swirled around to give the overarching genre of the Gospels. Bios sort of biography, but not 100% biography. Uh, you know, a, a modern biography, like I said, would be far more focused on sort of accuracy of historical minutiae, and this is, this is not. Uh, Apocalypsis and Midrash are the three main um, genres that lead into this. Uh, there are plenty of others that kind of would, would, would shed a light on the topic. But yeah, let's go with those three. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. Now, one of the things, if you pick up the, the Bible and you read any of the Gospels, you'll notice that although it kind of constructs a narrative arc, there are different components within that. And those, in a sense, are different genres within the genre of the Gospels. Um, and one of the things that's important to, re to recall is that when you are, each of those then operate in service of the dominant theme and focus of the gospel. So um, uh, I'm going to re reference Chad Myers, Chad Myers, Chad Myers, Chet, Chet Myers, I think it is, uh, book, uh, Binding the Strong Man. And he, he argues very strongly that the dominant uh, theme of Mark's gospel is sort of an ideological overthrow. And each of them, the subgenres, uh, you know, the miracles, all the rest of it, uh, all kind of reflect a different way of, of approaching that. So one of the genres in the gospels uh, is probably the parables. And the reason I'm starting there is that one of the easiest places to to see the 
the the the the the genre the kernel genre in the overall text um and the parables of jesus are short stories uh told to illustrate through simile or to provoke thought and conversation so uh the example i picked up there is from matthew chapter 13. Uh, all my scripture texts are quotes from the nrsv he, he, Jesus, put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it becomes the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Clearly, in that parable, that short story that Jesus tells, there's an, uh, an, in, an invitation to consider, in some way, the kingdom of heaven is like the mustard seed or perhaps the bush or the process of the gardening or, or something like that or perhaps even the person who plants the mustard seed we're invited into thinking about in what way is the kingdom of heaven like um, and one of the thing, things to keep in mind whenever you're looking at a parable uh, and there's a lot of things of course uh, but I think the biggest one are, who's the in-text audience? So if Jesus is, there, is uh, addressing a parable to say, well, if you think about the story of the Good Samaritan, it's directed to kind of a lawyer in the Jewish faith. So we might assume that then that target audience is being told something by that parable. And perhaps it's up to us to put ourselves in the feet of that target audience, in a faith-based reading. But if, if we want to pull it apart and interpret it and understand it, we need to understand who it's addressed to. Uh, we also need to think about the community that remembered it and those sorts of things. It's important also that we remember the cultural background of Jesus and his audience. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. So he's using Jewish symbolism. He's using Jewish, uh, and when I say Jewish, I'm, I'm talking about Jewish from 2,000 years ago, once again. Um, and he's using symbolism from around the Mediterranean, where he lives, those sorts of things. Uh, one of my favourite uh, scholars that I've recently been reading a bit more of is uh, uh, A.J. Levine, Amy Jill Levine. Uh, and her commentary on the mustard seed, I thought was fascinating, because she points out that it used to be a medicinal plant, that was open to everyone. Isn't that interesting? You know, and, and that kind of nuances then your understanding of the kingdom of God. So not only, so we, we, we've got that kind of thing um, going on that we understand better, or at least we can more fully engage in the conversation if we understand the background more. Um, the next sort of little sub-genre that I want to talk about, and I, I think it is important, I'm going to leave stuff out tonight, you know, um, I really am. And I kind of wish I didn't have to, but at the same time, it's such a huge topic. But I wanted to do this because I think it's important. And that's uh, what's sometimes described as the gloss. It's the voice of the narrator. Um, and it's important to note that the narrator actually shapes a lot of the interpretive lens, lens for each section. Um, and in, I've got a little example there from John chapter 19. Uh, so this is just before, well, uh, you know, Jesus' clothes are being separated. Uh, and the soldiers say, let us not tear it. So this is his cloak, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. You see, the gloss, the, the narrator's voice, cues us that we are supposed to interpret this act as being uh, fulfilling or overflowing of a scriptural, by scriptural, obviously Old Testament, what we would consider Old Testament, promise. So we, we that, that little gloss, it's important to just be aware that it's there. Um, and we can extend that in a sense to thinking about the voice of the editor in terms of linking parables together. So... Why do these four parables get linked together? And we're, we're invited into doing so as a sort of, as a common theme, 
But perhaps we should just be aware that we're not obliged to read it that way. So uh, the parables, that's, that's just to be aware that there is a, an editor's voice that we're getting. In the Gospels, we also get essentially direct teaching. Um, and probably the most famous example of that would be, I would suggest, uh, what's called the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain. Now, there's a little interesting side note. Does the geography matter? I would suggest the answer to that question is yes. And that's a sub-theme within each, how they nuance it. Um, but it's, you know, how they, how they nuance it is a theme within, um, yeah, uh, within each, within the individual Gospels. Uh, so maybe that's a topic for yet another night. Um, where was I? So teaching. Uh, we get a, a big chunk of teaching. And the, this is sometimes a collection of Jesus sayings, or I would suggest the, the sort of the Beatitudes were, was something that Jesus probably repeated more than once, and but it became the core teaching for the G, the early Jesus movement, and that then it carries with it a different way of interpreting than does uh, say the parables, and it's just a, it, it's important to be aware that it it is different. Um, I wanted to then keep going into uh, so poetry and hymnody. We often don't see it when we look at the Gospels uh, and when we look at the text, but they, they're full of poetry and hymns uh, and those sorts of things. So John's Gospel has probably the most, uh, well, the, the most famous example I'll say in John's Gospel is what's called the Logos hymn. It's the very beginning of John's Gospel, which is a hymn that deliberately references the Genesis story uh, and kind of tells us that because this hymn would have been familiar, that the gospel came from a context, a worshipping context, where perhaps people sang that hymn. You know, we don't have the music notes now, but it tells us a little bit about the audience, uh, but it's also important that we understand that it's a hymn, and so it carries with it a different way of interpreting. So just like we don't interpret hymns now as being uh, that kind of points to say theology or the invite or, or current concerns but they don't carry the same sort of we, we don't interpret them in the same way as we would say I don't know a lecture from one of my lecturers that I I so totally paid attention to and took all the notes they wanted me to take um, uh, there's also the Magnificat, um, which is in Luke's Gospel. Um, and, and so they tell us a little bit about the context. This is a, but they also tell it of the worship audience. But they also remind us that the top, the focus of the hymn, Jesus, is worthy to be sung to to be praised. That's a really um, important sort of thing to have in there, is the Gospels were helping people, one of their main themes was to sort of understand the, the importance of Jesus. And part of that is, we will sing songs to him, um, because he's so important. So important, in fact, that he is God with us. Uh, so, the, yeah. And then finally, the miracle stories. Um, when reading miracle stories, it's important to recall the other themes in the Gospels, uh, the Gospel in question, because they are structured to, to tell you something about Jesus, tell you something about the world, but they are also told in such ways to support other themes. Uh, for example, miracles in Mark's Gospel often work to illustrate the apocalyptic nature of Jesus and how uh, Jesus is going to come into conflict with the forces of the world. Um, and so the miracles guide you to that. So they show a person who heals, but they also support the apocalyptic nature. 
nature. In John's Gospel, the, the um, miracles are understood as signs. So they, are, they, they, they point to something, to, to the theolo theological uh, understanding of the person of Jesus, for example. So when you're dealing with genre and the Gospels, it is important to kind of keep an eye open for that sort of step back reading. Part of it is just remembering that it's not, it's not a genre that we really come across in other parts of our lives. We don't, um, we don't get these texts in other areas. Uh, and so... We just need to be aware that when we're reading them, we're reading a genre that's that we've got to put a bit of work into. And sometimes the work is just go and read all the other people's commentaries. Um, read commentaries from, from other people. Uh, look at the historical background. Um, look at the audience. Think about how is this written? What is that trying to communicate? Uh, and so hopefully that is a useful sort of set of places where we come across genres and genre in the Gospels. Oh, I think that's everything that I wanted to say for tonight. Uh, I'm going to see if there's any questions. If you have any questions or anything like that, throw them up there or send them out. I've tried to put uh, links in the notes so you can see where... Uh, where you can do further study um, and go from there yourselves. Oh, let's see if there are any questions or anything like that. All right, okay. Well, David says he found the notes. Reg says he's watching. Um, excellent. And we've got a thumbs up from Marilyn. Well, it's lovely. Excellent. Uh, well, if, if there are no other questions, I'm going to say thank you for sitting through that with me. And um, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.